And they, they, one of the first places they came to were the waters of Mirabah. Now the word mar, memrash, means bitter. And the water, they were really thirsty, and the waters were so bitter they couldn't drink it. And the first thing they did was start, Moshe, you big stupid jerk, why did you drag us out of Egypt to make us drink this and die of thirst in the desert? We're going back. He said, no, wait, stop. And it's like it appealed to the Almighty, come on. You know, you brought us out here and you give us bitter water. And he said, hey, quit yelling. Just just hang on. See that, see that tree right there? Go off. Cut a branch. Throw it in the water. And then the water became sweet. And you go, oh, a miracle. Well, I remember in the 70s, someone went out there and they found where that place was. And the water's still bitter. And the reason it's bitter, it's got all these minerals in it. And there's a tree growing right there that if you cut off the branch of the tree and throw it in the water, all the minerals sink to the bottom and the water's sweet. The problem is that if you drink the water that's bitter, it'll completely detoxify your whole internal digestional tract and would have probably killed all the parasites they were killing, carrying with them from Egypt. He provided them healing and all they could do is whine about it. How typical of us. Because we don't know. But Yahweh didn't say in the scripture, Thou shalt drink the bitter water and so purify your parasitical infestation. But that's what would have happened according to what these guys researched. But it doesn't even tell us that in Scripture. So here's supplemental findings, whether or not they're true, I can't account for it. But it's an interesting understanding to have. But he also provided, okay, 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 quit yelling, quit whining. Throw the tree in and deal with your parasites. There, I hope you're happy. Well, that's also a typical behavior that Yahweh does. For example, he brought him into the desert and was going to give him the promised land, and the spies went in and they saw giants, and they said, he brought us out here to kill us in the desert. Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt? And he says, don't say that. And they said it again. He brought us out here to kill us. And Yahweh basically said, if you keep saying that, that's exactly what's going to happen. So they said, oh yeah? Well, guess what? We think you brought us out here to kill us in the desert. He says, all right, that's it. Forty years, you're all going to die in the desert, just like you said. Here's the curse. You get what you want. And you get what you speak. So when the sorcerers and witches speak, they pick very particular words, spelled a very particular way, and they project them. What are they doing? Casting spells. But what are they doing? They're taking their will and imposing it over another's will. So there's this little thing, love potion number nine. Okay, how do you make this person love you? Oh, okay, well they don't want to love me, so I'm going to usurp their will and intoxicate them with drugs or with projected words, demonic influence, so that they will love me. That's not love, that's robotic hypnotism. Yahweh himself won't even do that. There was a neighbor, another culture from the other side of the world, and he said, he was talking to me one day and he says, you know, you see a homeless person and you think, they, they need some money, they need, they need some food. But I don't trust them to buy food. They're probably going to go get some alcohol. I know them guys. So tell you what, I'm going to buy them a hamburger and give it to them and say, here, eat this if you're hungry. But he says, you know, even the Almighty, what's the greatest gift that he gave to humanity? The greatest gift. Choice choice. I'm going to write that word here for a minute. Choice. How you doing? How does a human <laughs> implement the gift of choice? How does that work? How does that play out in real life? What do you think? Has it been very well? <laughs> no, the concept that, that if the greatest gift that the Almighty could possibly give a human is choice, and you say, I would like a gift from the Almighty, 
And he says, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. It's like, whoa, okay, what is it going to be? How would you notice the choice? What does that look like? How would you know whether you're given this gift or not? Do you mean that you've been given the gift of choice or another gift? How does the one? gift of choice present itself? If someone's going to give you a gift, say it's on your birthday, it's presented as a box with colorful paper and maybe some ribbons on it with your name on it. How would you notice in real life this gift of choice being presented to you? You had your hand up. Well, um, I, I think that emotion would play a big part in it. Uh, uh, desire of appealing, whatever, it would, uh, which way it would appeal to you. Which way what uh, would appeal to you? The, the, the two... You have a choice of what? Of whatever you, whatever's presented to you, and and you, your emotion would cause you to choose which one appeals to you. If you were driving down the road and you come to a T intersection or a fork in the road, there's a choice: you turn right or turn left. If he says, "This is the seventh day," I'm telling you to sit down. You have a choice. Sit down or don't sit down. There's a presentation. Yeah? You were going to say something? You had a... Did I? I was going to say, I, I'm i going to choose, first off, do I want to live or die? Moshe said, I put before you life and death. And I suggest you choose life. That's, that's a big choice he's given us. We could choose to be here at Sukkot or not. Yeah? Ultimately... Yah could compel us to do whatever He wanted us to do, including obey and love Him. But He's given us the freedom to determine on our own, do we want to commit ourselves to Him? So I see it as a reflection by us giving, by Him giving us choice. Those that come to Him it's completely free will. It is, he did not force them into that covenant relationship. Now, listen to what he said there. He's saying that Yahweh has presented himself in the scripture as offering a free, unprovoked or unthreatened offer to be in relationship to him. I will be your Elohim and you will be my people. Now he's going to sweeten the pot carrot and the stick. He says, if I am your Elohim, I will provide everything you need. I will be your champion and defender. I will let you be with me forever and to the beyond the wildest imagination of an extent of time, eternity. I'll be your healer. I'll be your defense and shield. I'll be your counselor. And the list goes on and on and on. That's the carrot. And on the stick side, the model I grew up with, and if you decide no, well, there's a lake of fire that I'll throw you into. And uh, there's some enemies that I'll allow to tear you apart and to steal your stuff and to lie to you and all that. So that's the stick. But here's an interesting thing. We're told that in the future, the Messiah is going to come back and rule with a rod of iron. Not just a carrot and a stick, but a rod of iron. It's like, oh, man. Does that mean he's suddenly going to change his character and threaten us with beatings with an iron scepter? If you wouldn't think that he has to maintain his character, that might be the picture you come up with. But if you go, wait a minute, he says he doesn't change the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then if he presents himself with giving the greatest gift, being choice, then why should he come back later and say, no more than Mr. Nice Guy. No choice for you. The choice is still there. Is it? With yeah. the rod of iron? Yeah. Here's because my suggestion. The, the nations can choose to send their leaders <laughs> at the times of the feasts in that time. Okay, here's the point. Or choose the consequence. Here's the point. When we read something that says rod of iron... <laughs> No sofa for you. I 
you're my guest. I own this place. <laughs> okay, here, here's my point. What I'm saying is that if we read something, rod of iron, and we picture it a certain way, it might be inconsistent with what he said. And so then what we need to do is go back and say it needs to be consistent, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what we understand about what he made very clear, we should then apply to that which we're now we're trying to imagine. That's what I'm saying. So going back to the name Yahweh that I mentioned yesterday, yod Hey vav Hey, the hand of the Creator, the expression, the Torah, Vav, the Mashiach, the Torah incarnate, and then the Ruach that will lead us into the truth, the second hay that looks like the first hay. So if the Messiah is going to be presented a certain way, Vav, hay, it has to be identical to Yod, hay. Yod, hay has to equal Vav, hay like a mirror reflection. No distinction of difference. Therefore, I was at a church one time, and a guy who had an apost apostolic, an, an apostle title, was coming to speak. He was from another state, and apparently, I mean, I ended up showing up at the meeting very late. I couldn't find the place, but, but apparently he was getting words from the Father to where he would come up, and somebody was holding a recording device, and he'd give you a word. They'd record it and give that to you, and he'd get a word from the Father for you, and someone said, man, this guy, this guy's the stuff, man. It's not just a word from Jesus or the Holy Spirit. This is a word from the Father Himself. Whoa, gosh. And I had a problem with that. Sorry, I had a problem. Silly me, I, I don't understand. Yeshua said, I only say the things I hear the Father saying. If the Father speaks, He speaks through his Torah, or through Yeshua, or through the Ruach, it's his voice. How can anybody tell the difference between the voice of the Father, let's say that's represented by the Yod, or the voice of the Torah, the voice of the Hey, the voice of the Vav, or the voice of the other Hey? It's all the same voice, indistinguishable. How can somebody say this is the voice of the Father? I don't get it. I don't understand. And before I ever got into looking at the Torah stuff, it bugged me even back then. That was around. Uh, 2000, the year 2000 or so. If Yeshua said, I only say the things I hear the Father saying, then Yod equals Vav. And if the Ruach HaKodesh, that second hay, leads us into the truth, or along the path of the truth, which is the Torah, that's the first hay, then you can't distinguish hay from hay. Because the voice is Achad, one singular, so indistinguishable one from the next that you can't tell one from the next. That's my perception of it. So if he says, he's going to rule with a rod of iron, and by golly, if you don't do what he says, wham, you're smashed. It's like, no, wait a second. Isn't he the same guy that gave us the gift of choice? What I'm saying is, the study of reading his words. What did he say? What did he mean? We have to find that there's a certain revealing of himself in those words. And if we trust that there's a consistency, then we can use that consistency between the Yod, the hey, the Bob, and the hey as a way to double check what it is we think we're reading. If this word ikur means to become suddenly very valuable, like for example, the Native Americans that lived in um, not even a particular tribal association, but <coughs> South Dakota and also even in California, they in their culture, apparently, from what I understand, did not value gold couldn't eat it, it was too soft to build a weapon with it or a tool with it. They didn't make wristwatches and trinkets, they just had no value, so they left it laying on the ground, they just didn't care. All of a sudden, somebody else comes rolling into town who goes, Ding! you know, big dollar signs in his eyeballs. It's like, Gah! not only am I going to 
grab this stuff, I'm going to set myself into a frenzy, finding it, and I'm going to start killing people next to me, stealing from the people next to me, and turn the whole place into a big giant, uh, well, they did this hydro mining down in California where blasting under high pressure and destroyed the landscape, trying to get every little speck they could find. But the people that lived there before lived there and didn't do any of that. This people group valued it. This people group didn't value it. And this word ikur means to, to come across the value and suddenly go nuts with the value. Kind of like what I've been doing with the Hebrew. Or kind of like what if you never read the Bible and all of a sudden somebody shows you the Bible and shows you that it's the very words from the creator of the heavens and the earth. And even if you didn't read Hebrew and you go, what, really? My brother tells me of this story they brought to Nigeria who didn't even have a written language. They finally got the book of Luke. I showed him the movie, the, the Jesus movie. Then they got the book of Luke and taught him how to read. And then they showed up one day in a truck and were handing out books that they could read his word in their language and he was saying how there's this one lady I mean this is like after what centuries of never knowing never hearing never reading and she took this book and as she was walking across the field to get back to, you know back to where she lived she just stopped and dropped to her knees she couldn't take another step his words in my language. And I said, that's the way I feel about so suddenly being able to read his words in his language. How can I take another step to suddenly see his words in his language? He designed each and every letter not just the shape of the letter, but the meaning of the letter, and what the letter communicates, which is himself. But that's not the way Hebrew is taught. Hebrew is taught as just another language. Might as well learn Portuguese or French or Spanish. doesn't matter. It's just another language. But that's not true. It does matter. It isn't just another language. I believe it's his language, and I'm going to show you that in just, just a couple minutes here. But what I'm trying to show you is that just in this word, ikur, means to come to the realization that this thing is incredibly valuable and your whole world changes, just like the natives who lived there that didn't valuable gold and then all of a sudden somebody comes up who realized in their culture the value of gold and it became an incredible feeding frenzy like a mass of sharks. That's ikur, disregarding the alley. But then if you look under the dictionary under Kufresh Aleph, which is this word here, Kufresh Aleph, and you'll look at the dictionary, it means to call and invite and summon. Just what Rad and Kelly did for this group here. They put out the call, they invited and summoned to come to a meeting, an assembly. That's what this is. Mikra is the place and the occasion of location to that place where you have been called and summoned. But the word Kufresh Aleph also means, if you look in the dictionary, to learn to read, to study reading the scripture. It also means to receive the invitation to come up front and read the Torah portion to the synagogue. So whenever I read this word in scripture, it's simply translated, he called. It's like, could you call the dog over here? He shouldn't be in that area. And if you read the text in English, that's all it's translated as. But I choose then to say, every time I see this word ikur, or ikra, or mikra, it's, he invited me to learn how to read scripture. And it was specifically at the festivals. He has provided the festivals for the occasion where he has sent out the invitation to come and spend time with him, because these are his modim, to learn how to read his words. 
And guess what? That's what we're doing. But for over 50 years of my life, it never happened. Nor was I ever encouraged to consider it as a happening possibility. I never had the choice presented. But an invitation is offering a choice. There could have been a hundred people sitting here, but you're sitting here. You responded to the call. So when Yahweh calls out, would anybody like to see my face? Like the, the word I said the other day, pane, is the word pay, face. Pay, noon, yod. Pay is a mouth that opens, a noon jumps out, and the yod is the hand that not only means that this is mine, but it's a hand that causes something to happen. So that looks like a word being spoken. Yahweh spoke, bam, there's the universe. It's effective, just like casting a spell. Words out of your mouth. The word, just, just to play off that, to show you a little bit more at another level, if you say encantation, uh-oh, that's casting a spell. See that word can't and can't? If you know how to break down English words, this is to put it in some sort of action, and this is another <coughs> tense of grammar. It's, have you ever heard of the word cantar? Sing. It means to sing in Spanish. Have you ever heard of a cantor? He's the guy in the Jewish synagogue that sings the Torah. You ever heard of a cantilever? <coughs> a cantilever is where you have a certain weight and you project this out and it looks like it's suspended. Oh no, what if that's going to fall down? No, it can't. It's supported by this back here. If you project out words, they're not just empty words. They're supported by something else back here. Yahweh said so. We're not talking about empty, stupid words with made-up meanings. The study of the language is to understand what is the solid base behind every letter, every word, because Yahweh said so, and because He designed the whole thing as a cantilever, it is engineered, and it works. It can't not work. He designed it, He engineered it, and this is what it is. But I was never told anything about it. You can look at a bunch of other words that have to do with this. And they all fit. <clears throat> Why is it called Leviticus? Because it was instructions to the Levite. But if the Levitical order of priesthood is completely done away with, then it's got nothing to do with us, so what do we care? None of these things are for us. But if it's not Leviticus, if it's Vaikra, then you go to the very book that starts with, he called and invited to whoever would choose to see his face, to learn how to read Hebrew and understand the words that came out of his mouth. And then he says in Ezekiel 20, half a dozen times he says, he gave us commandments and ordinances and statutes and his testimonies, which if a man does, he will live in them, by them, through them, among them. Prefix letter bet. But it's your choice. And I could then say, well, where's the rod of iron? I think of the letter Zadi as a scepter of iron. So that when I see that that letter Zadi lines up with the Ark of the Covenant, this little glyph of the Ark of the Covenant, it also lines up with the eighth day, which is Shemini Atzeret. It also lines up with the Shabbat, Sabbath day. It also lines up with the resurrection. This is a sprout. It also lines up with a fish hook, and some people say not only a fish hook, but the word Zod has to do with a hunter. And he said he will send fishermen and hunters to bring his people back. And some of people think that has to do with the tribulation. Some people think that has to do with the last call going out. Regardless, I can look at that 
and say it has something to do with all these themes, all of which are really significant, so that in my mind I can apply the themes to the letter that looks like a scepter, and the word zadi means righteousness. And he said the foundation of his throne was mishpat and zadikah, zadikah's righteousness, but it's also victory, deliverance, and salvation. So I could say this has something to do with our getting the victory, but also something about our salvation. But suddenly, if I mention this word salvation, it invokes the Christian paradigm that says, well, that's by the blood of Jesus. If I think, okay, the word salvation has to do with the blood of Jesus, I'm not denying that, but what I'm saying is, because it locks into that package, I now miss out on anything else it might refer to regarding all this stuff. Shemini Atzeret. If you don't keep the festivals, you've got no idea what that is. And if you think that the fourth festival is <coughs> waving the loaves on the day of Pentecost, then you just miss Shemini Atzeret. Different pattern. So what I'm saying is that if there's a correlation between the scepter, the iron scepter, well then I have to sit there and look at the word for iron, which is Brazil, and break down that word and say, well, what does that mean? It all goes back to learning how to read, which is what he invited us to do as the way to see his face. And then I can sit there and say, how much is it worth it? So if I sat here and pursued this rabbit trail, that would take the rest of the time we have. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just bringing up this as a point to show you kind of where this stuff can go. Getting a phone call like that is like putting out an invitation to come to Sukkot and learn how to read. You want to answer the call or not? Your choice. Why am I making a big deal about the choice? Because I want to show you something about that word regarding the alphabet. The alphabetic sequence can be read as an entire story. Uh, excuse me a minute. Let me erase this and we start over. Just talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Anybody got a good joke? Well, that choice reminds me of let's make a deal. You got three curtains and you got the box. So you can pick one of the curtains or you can take what's behind the box. What do you suppose is behind those curtains? Uh, one good huh? prize. Huh? Yeah, either a, a you know a car uh, or a pig with a corn cobs that he's already ate the corn off of. And you never know. Sometimes it was a practical joke, but I got to figure that if Yahweh says, "Hey, I'm offering you suffering." Something it's not going to be a pig with a half eaten corn cob, it'll be a something of great value. Yeah. Hidden treasure as the title of this stuff that we're talking about. That doesn't that first choice lead into a lifetime of choices where we have to weigh what we find as to what kind of treasure we're going to pursue? Well, every choice changes the world. Every choice sets up an infinite number of other choices. Absolutely. Just for what it's worth, I mentioned this the other day, and if somebody might find it interesting, there's a little thing called the Mandelbrot set. There's a guy named <laughs> Dr. Robert Lyle, <coughs> L-I-S-L-E, who gave a talk. He's given a number of talks. He used a PowerPoint, so basically all the talks end up being the same. I never use the PowerPoint, so every talk is different. Just, just there's a difference in what I'm saying. So if, if, uh, if you look at his talk, any one you pick, you'll probably see the same message, which is okay. But the point is, that's a, a shape, an Im 